And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Gospel for today tells us that the Spirit drove our Lord into the wilderness. Why? There are many ways we could try to answer that, but this morning I want to offer just two thoughts. Number one, the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness to reveal him as a victorious Israel. As Israel was baptized in the Red Sea, so Jesus was baptized in the Jordan. As Israel wandered through the wilderness for 40 years, Jesus wandered through the desert for 40 days. As Israel faced trials and temptations, so Jesus faced trials and temptations. There are many parallels, but one crucial difference. Where Israel failed, Jesus was victorious. Through the inspired psalmist, God expresses his displeasure with Israel in Psalm 95. He says, For forty years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Compare these words of displeasure with the Father's words to the Son in today's Gospel. With you I am well pleased. Tremper Longman and Raymond Dillard are helpful here. They write, Jesus had become a remnant of one. He was the embodiment of faithful Israel, the truly righteous and suffering servant. Unlike the remnant of the Restoration period, he committed no sin. As the embodiment of the faithful remnant, he would undergo divine judgment for sin, that is the cross, endure an exile, three days forsaken by God in the grave, and experience a restoration to life, that is, his resurrection, as the foundation of a new Israel, inheriting the promises of God afresh. As the remnant restored to life, he becomes the focus of the hopes for the continued existence of the people of God in a new kingdom, a new Israel of Jew and Gentile alike. Jesus is victorious Israel. He perfectly keeps Israel's end of the covenant, and in him all of God's promises are fulfilled. He is the suffering servant, the son of David, the faithful remnant, the ultimate prophet, the reigning king, the final priest. Jesus faced the wilderness, and unlike Israel, he won. Secondly, the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness to reveal him as a victorious Adam. Now you say, where do you get that in this text? Well, St. Mark includes a very curious little detail in his short version of the temptation of Christ, a detail which is not included in any other of the Gospel accounts. He writes, And he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals. What's that about? And why does Mark include this seemingly insignificant little detail? His account is already so short. Why mention the wild animals? Commentators go nuts with this, but let me ask you this. Where else in Scripture do we see a solitary man with animals around being tempted by Satan? The garden. The garden. <laughs> She's paying attention, folks. <laughs> the garden. The first Adam is placed in a beautiful garden, feasting on all the fruits of the trees, surrounded by serene animals at peace, at, in, in shalom, with all creation. But Adam succumbed to Satan's lies. Because of Adam's failure, creation came under the curse. The garden gave way to a barren waste. Because of the first Adam's sin, the second Adam is now placed not in a garden, but in the wilderness. Not feasting on fruit, but fasting. Not surrounded by peaceful animals, but with the wild animals. He too now faces the temptation of the serpent. But the second Adam is victorious. 
One writer says, The serpent's lies were designed to undermine Adam and Eve's confidence in God and to tempt them to find their identity independently of him. In succumbing to the serpent's lies, they turned from their father and became disobedient children. Jesus now faces the same temptation to chart a course of independence from the will of his father, to use his divinity for his own ends, for pleasure, power, and prestige. But the new Adam does not succumb. He's not like the disobedient children. He is the obedient son. He chooses the road of obedience to his father and the road of humility, going to the cross to reconcile and restore all that was lost. Jesus goes willingly into the wilderness precisely in order to restore it to the garden. As the prophet Isaiah foretold, listen to this now, For the Lord comforts Zion, he comforts all her waste places, and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. In Revelation 22, at the end of all things, we see a vision of a restored heavenly Eden, with the river of God and the tree of life. Isaiah says that there will be no more wild animals there. Rather, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. Shalom will be restored. In Romans 5, St. Paul calls Adam a type of the one who was to come. He says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. As we sing in the great hymn, O loving wisdom of our God, when all was sin and shame, a second Adam to the fight and to the rescue came. O wisest love, that flesh and blood, which did in Adam fail, should strive afresh against the foe, should strive and should prevail. In the wilderness, we see Jesus as the victorious Israel, and we see Jesus as the victorious Adam. Now, what do these mysteries have to do with us? The answer, I think, is that we share in his victory, both corporately as a victorious new people, and individually as a victorious new man. First, a victorious new people. Listen again to Longman and Dillard. As the nucleus of a renewed Israel, Christ summons the little flock that will receive the kingdom and appoints judges for the twelve tribes of Israel in the new age, that is, the twelve apostles. The church is viewed as the Israel of that new age. The twelve tribes, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. God's new people, made up of those from all tribes and tongues, can be victorious in a way that Israel never could. Longman goes on, A sinful nation, Israel could not suffer vicariously to atone for the sins of the world. The sinfulness of the nation made it unacceptable for this role, just as flaws would disqualify any other offering. Only a truly righteous servant could bear this awful load. Now, God's new people, the church, have been united to and dwell in and are identified with the righteous servant. Not only have our sins been completely done away with by the suffering servant, he is now our living head. We have been made one with him, we are in him and he is in us. He is the head of the, the, the church, his body. The Holy Spirit that dwells in him now inhabits us. The, the, the victory that he won is now ours as the new people of God. 
That's the new corporate reality. But there's also an individual reality for each of us. Christ is the new Adam so that we can die to the old man and put on the new man. Now, now please don't stumble over the gender here. This is a scriptural metaphor, and it doesn't work as well if we try to force political correctness upon it. The new man Christ comes to redeem the old man Adam so that we can die to the old man and live in the new man. Of course, women are included in this new man. St. Paul writes in Colossians, You have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now, this is both an accomplished reality. We have died to the old man and put on the new man by faith and baptism into Christ. We are no longer in Adam. We are in Christ. But, but, this putting off and putting on is also, in a sense, ongoing. And here's where the application comes this morning. We are not yet perfected in the new man. The thoughts and habits and priorities of the old man still haunt us. And the goal now of the Christian life is to progressively put on the new man. That is, to put on Christ. Listen again to Paul in Ephesians. You were taught with reference to your former way of life to lay aside the old man who is being corrupted in accordance with deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new man who has been created in God's image in righteousness and holiness that comes from truth. This is now our Lenten project. We now find ourselves in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. Of course, this season of Lent itself is a microcosm of the whole of the Christian life. During Lent, we renew our resolve to put off the old man and to put on the new man. We progress through the wilderness of this life until we come at last to the promised land, to the eternal Eastertide. The good news for us this morning is that Christ has already won the victory in the wilderness. His victory is our victory. All that the Father has given to him is now declared unto us. His grace prevents us and his mercy follows us. The great Lenten hymn reflects these mysteries so well. And if Satan, vexing sore, flesh or spirit should assail, thou, his vanquisher before, grant we may not faint or fail. So shall we have peace divine. Holier gladness ours shall be. Round us too shall angels shine, such as ministered. To thee. Yes, we find ourselves in the wilderness, and even with Christ, the Spirit has driven us into the wilderness. But we are here by him, and with him, and in him. And through him, we shall not faint nor fail.